On the air everywhere, this is New England Broadcasting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's the Ron Van Dam Show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Well, every once in a while we do an interview special. This is one of those uh, extra programs. These are interview guests uh, that were recently uh, with us, and uh, we present them to you for the first time now in this interview special. It runs a little bit over an hour, so get yourself ready for this. Full of doctors, experts, uh, authors, you name it, uh, interesting people. Let's get to it right away. Hi, Ron. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Amy Artuzzo joins us. She's a safety expert at the National Safety Council, which quite obviously is involved in safety. And uh, we're talking about accidental deaths. Kind of don't think about that all that frequently, do we? No, but you know what? Um, Recently, the National Safety Council conducted a survey to get a better understanding of public perception about preventable deaths or what's more commonly referenced as accidental death. All right. Uh, what, what, what exactly is an accidental death? How are we defining this? Um, accidental deaths are preventable deaths. And through this survey, we found that four, or well, more than 70% of respondents correctly identified car crashes as a preventable uh, death. Right. More than 60% uh, correctly identified falls as a preventable death. Uh However, some are still including things like natural disasters, and that is not correct. And only 40% correctly associated drug overdose with accidental death, and that is actually the leading cause of preventable deaths right now. Yeah. So preventable death is anything that you have have within your control? Yeah. These are deaths that we know how to stop. All right. Okay. So, um... (laughs) Being aware of that and realizing what an accidental death is, uh, I guess the survey, I'm assuming, showed that most of us don't really think along those those lines. I know a lot of people that say, hey, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> okay. You know, is that an attitude? Um, so we didn't look so much at attitudes, but what I can tell you is four out of ten of the respondents yeah. did say they've been directly impacted by a preventable death. Uh-huh. And... 21% say their actions have contributed to a preventable death. Yeah. Um, the good news, again, is that we know how to stop these. Another mm-hmm. thing that I think was interesting is 77% uh, think that they're safest in their homes, and that's understandable, but yeah. in actuality, more than 75% of preventable deaths are happening in homes and communities. Yeah. So we're really trying to raise awareness and provide education on simple things that people can do around their homes that will make a big difference to protect them and their loved ones. Okay. Now, before we do that, uh, does the survey vary from state to state? It does. And I can tell you in Massachusetts, preventable mm-hmm. deaths decreased less than 1% from 2016 to 2017. And the top two causes of preventable death for Massachusetts in 2017 were falls and motor vehicles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I assume motor vehicles is pretty much across the board nationwide. It is. It is the lead, or a leading cause, yeah. the second leading cause of death starting at age five and up. Um, once you hit 65 years old, uh-huh. then poisoning, which has a lot to do with our opioid crisis, oh. that becomes the leading cause of death. Over 65? Wow. Um, over, I'm sorry. Over 65 is falls. 25 and up. 25 to 64 is the poisoning. Yeah, Yeah, I don't see a lot of seniors uh, (laughs) doing that. No, no, I'm sorry. It's falls. (laughs) Okay, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I've been scared of falls since I was five, so I don't know. (laughs) I guess it depends. Um, Okay, so uh, what are some, some tips that can actually... I mean, I, it's it's an awareness situation, obviously, so that you can be aware that certain things are preventable, that they don't have to be uh, accidents. But how, how do we do that? How do we take into action here? So with the poisoning and opioid crisis um, being the leading cause, we'll start with the medicine cabinet. You know, 
make sure you know or check your medicine cabinet. If you have expired medications, dispose of them properly. Keep track of your medications mm-hmm. so that you know others aren't taking them. Keep them up and away and out of sight for children. Right. When it cars, comes to cars, you know, put your phones away. Buckle up every time. Oh Choose to put your phone away so yes. you're not texting and driving. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. When it comes to fires, smoke yeah. detectors, yeah. have a fire escape plan in your home. Uh-huh. The idea. list goes on and on. So yeah. I, I encourage people to visit nsc.org mm-hmm. for more information about a variety of topics. You know, you've you've mentioned uh, uh, driving and accidents, and I'm I'm actually fearful of this because uh, now that marijuana has been legalized in some states and, of course, soon to be many more, uh, mm-hmm. The onslaught of social media uh, and and having cell phones in, in cars, it just like it's like we've created a, a large volume of of even more dangerous situations driving wise. Where the worst before was alcohol and eating a sandwich. Right, and you, you know you're correct. And the the survey did ask people if they had safety concerns um, when marijuana is legalized, whether mm-hmm. it's recreational or medicinal. And more than 60% did identify yeah. that they have concerns about impairment on the roadways um, through marijuana impairment. Yeah. And it, that number jumps up to more than 70% when you talk about the workplace. Yeah. It's a very scary time. And then also you have a, you know, political problems. But that's besides the point. <laughs> that, was an, that was an accident, too. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so, all right. So there's a list of... of things that we can, and it's funny because I'm aware of the list. And when I went through the list, most of it seemed like common sense. So basically it was, it was just jogging my, my common sense is what it was doing. Right. You're right. But it's common sense, as you mentioned, in a way that, or people don't think about it until Mm -hmm. somebody brings it up. So that's what the national safety council is trying to do. Yeah. Unfortunately, you learn these lessons after an incident has occurred, then you're more careful. And unfortunately that's, a, a nasty way to live. Um, Most people think it's not going to happen to them until it's too late. Exactly. It, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, one more time where we can go to get more information. Um, you can go to nsc.org for a variety of information, but we're releasing the survey in combination with National oh, okay. Safety Month. Yep. And so nsc.org slash NSM for National Safety Month. Okay, one more time, please. NSC dot org slash nsm for national safety month excellent amy thank you for opening our eyes here today thank you very much take care bye-bye you too okay bye-bye hi ron it's bonnie how are you hey bonnie how you doing today i'm doing well Wonderful. Bonnie Schneider joins us. She's been with us before. She's a national television meteorologist and author of a new book called Extreme Weather. Extreme Weather is is quite the, uh, become part of the English language here. Uh, I, Trump even uh, thinks it confuses extreme weather and uh, climate change. So it's interesting. Uh, it is interesting because <laughs> climate and weather are two totally different yes, things. Yes, they are. So, yeah. um, and, you know, but obviously climate change is influencing extreme weather, and that's yes. one of the many reasons why we're seeing so much more in terms of frequency of extreme weather. And that's really been, for me as a meteorologist, you know, fascinating to track. Even if you look back last year, 2018, mm-hmm. we had $14 billion separate disasters, like hurricanes, storms, winter storms drought, wildfires, and even hailstorms. Mm-hmm. And that was just last year. And when you look at, let's say, three years, 2016, 17, and 18, that the average annual number of billion-dollar disasters, that was more than double the long-term average just in those three years. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's for sure on the rise. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, well, you know, it, it costs more money every year to, to do the same thing that you were doing 10 years ago. Uh, but on the other hand, every time we have an extreme weather situation, it's always the worst of all time or the second worst or the third worst, but it always ranks up there. <laughs> it's like every, every, every weather storm seems to rank these days. Yeah, and, you know, we were just talking about climate change, and one of the reasons we see the intensity of those kind of storms is because when the atmosphere is even slightly warmer, mm-hmm. it can hold more moisture. So that supercharges floods like we saw last year with Hurricane Harvey in Houston. You know, or snowstorms like you might see in Boston. You know, it just yeah. gives you a, 
uh, you know, that extra something where we say, wow, this is a really bad one. It's lasting longer than, than it normally we yeah, see that. yeah, and that actually is the case. A lot of people have said that. Well, that's because uh, weather, the weather technology is so much more communicative that we're learning uh, about storms all over the world, and there's more research done, and we can actually see the storm, so it's more impactful. But that's not the case. They, they actually are bigger storms. Yeah, I, I think that's true, and I think that what you said is a, is an excellent point because. The fact that we can, you know, put the pictures on Instagram immediately mm-hmm. of the storm and share faster on social media and just through the technology that we have, you're right. I mean, it, it might give the impression of more storms, mm-hmm. but um, it's just a way of sharing information. The, the facts are the facts that we're, you know, having these billion-dollar disasters um, yeah. and increasingly in years. It's it's heartbreaking. I mean, we're looking at the floods now going on in the Midwest, and it's like, wow, I don't remember seeing things so widespread like that before. Everything is like monumental. Um, yeah. But so, but the point is that uh, it's no longer a what if situation. It it's more of a when it does happen because it's getting more toward that. Uh, being prepared is not just a, a small insurance policy. It's it's a real thing. Yeah, and, you know, in my book, Extreme Weather, I talk a lot about how to prepare for all types of Mm -hmm. disasters. And one of the things you want to do now, because we're just starting hurricane season and it's calm now, is get together your basic disaster supplies, which Mm -hmm. include a three-day supply of food and water, you know, for everyone in the family, photocopies of your credit cards and ID. I know we use our phone, everything's electronic, but an old-fashioned photocopy is a good thing. Um, First aid kit, flashlight, radio batteries, and... I also recommend creating a family disaster plan so everybody in the family, you might have multiple generations living uh-huh. under one roof, make sure everybody knows what to do in the event of an emergency and how you would evacuate and who would you contact in the case of an, of an emergency. And you want to protect your, your home and your property as well. You know, Ron, one of the things that we had to deal with last year were tremendous hailstorms. And hail can cause so much damage to your car, you know, to your home. So you want to keep your car in the garage, for example, and fully gassed in case you had to leave. Yes. Um, that's something I recommend, and your phone's charged as well. But, you know, I mentioned about hail. One, one of the things is making sure your insurance is covered for something like that. Sure. And having insurance coverage now and, and checking it and making sure it's, it's all accurate before the storm hits is so important because... Let's say, for example, someone's waiting till like a hurricane watch is issued, you know, for their community, and mm. then they say, you know, I don't know if my insurance covers this. Oh, yeah. That that could potentially be too late because yeah. some insurance companies may put a freeze on new policies within a few days of a storm to avoid cases of fraud. So you want to make sure you do this before the storm hits. And um, I, I'm working with insurance, and one of the tools they have is this coverage counselor online where you can answer some questions. Let's say you're unsure of what you need. Um, it's a great tool to figure out what you might need in terms of uh, insurance. Yeah, I mean, that's becoming almost, uh, well, it's definitely a part of it. And, well, in some states, you can't even get a mortgage without getting uh, decent home insurance coverage for things like that, yeah. you, especially if you're and in a flood true. zone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's so true because you want to make sure your insurance provider is transparent. So yeah. there's no, you know, miscommunication. Or, am I covered for this? Am I covered for that? Um, so that's really important. And another thing is to know what your deductible is. Yeah. Uh, this, this is key because imagine if you had a really astronomical deductible and you weren't aware of it. You, you, putting aside emergency funds for whatever your deductible is just in case is a great idea. Yeah. You know, don't get caught off guard. The disasters are traumatic enough and then to have to deal with the financial burden so if there's anything you can do now to just put some money aside just in case you need it um i would recommend that yeah. and 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 thinking also about being affordable one of the things you can do to look for a discount is bundling um to see if your insurance company can bundle your home and auto policies sure. because that way sure. you get a discount and what's interesting also ron is that let's say somebody has car insurance mm-hmm. they might think that it can cover everything, but but having comprehensive car insurance is so much more important because mm. yes, of course you want to be covered. God forbid there's an accident, but what if a tree hits your car? Yes. You know that that could be something different. So make sure you're very clear and transparent that you you have an affordable package for insurance. And um, if you can get one deductible for both your home and car uh, damaged in the same disaster, that's ideal. Yeah. That's something that insurance provides. It, it I think it's just you know we have enough expenses anywhere we can save money is very important. Yes, uh, but now we're talking about uh, an insurance uh, faction that is uh, that you really must have. Um, I remember when I was going to school and I was a young kid, we had fire drills, 
And uh, that was in case there was a fire. The, the the place never caught on fire, never was the situation. But we we drilled like once a month. So why not do a, a home drill uh, in case there was a disaster around your home for whatever reason, even a fire uh, or, yeah, or a weather I, situation? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, my family lives in Florida, and, and they actually, uh, with my little nephew, I, my sister was saying that they practice. This is what we're going to do. Yes. This is the, the most interior room in the house if we had to, you know, take shelter. Yeah. Um, and it helps with children especially because then they're not as scared, yeah. you know, if, if, we're, if it's rehearsed. I, I think that's a good idea. I, I, I mean, I'm concerned about hail now. I never thought about hail before as being something I should be con- It's like, wow, what the hell is going on? But it is what it is. Hey, Bonnie, let's make some money. Here's what we do. We invent a, a solar power generator for when the power goes out. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for like for a few days because uh, it's, it's, it's a solar deal. Is there anything like that? You know, I don't know, but I would think that that's let's tricky, right? Because Why? what if... Why? What if it's a storm and you don't get the sun? <laughs> yeah, know? but it's supposed to store. Um, it's supposed to store up the energy in the in the cell, I, I guess. I we'll, we'll work yeah, on it. We'll I don't have one of those. No, there but, is. You know, there's no such thing. Power. You know, yeah. these types of storms, whether it's a winter storm, yeah. you know, or or in the summer, you know, you, power outages are possible. That's oh yeah. Why, oh yeah. Um, you know, be prepared for that, and yeah. you know, things like having some extra cash in, at home in case yeah. you can't use an ATM. Um, I write a, a lot about that in my book. Um, you know, and one of the things that you can use, of course, now, it's funny, I think we talked before, mm-hmm. you know, but in recent years, technology yes. keeps changing and getting yes. better. Yes. So using technology is really important because right. I remember covering different natural disasters uh, as a television meteorologist, uh-huh. and sometimes you, the, the cell service dies. Correct. And everybody's trying to reach everybody, their relatives and everything. So while cell service might die, you can um, often still text message. So it's important that everyone right. in the family has a contact person they can text. Right. Um, if you're separated, I right. recommend that as well. And and um, we're talking about insurance as well. A lot of the you know technology now mm. with a great app, you can upload uh, photos and things like that, and and find out whether or not you're covered in advance quickly. So technology is also important with your insurance company um, as well, where yeah. you can potentially you know take pictures of of of, of any damage yeah. that way. And you know we all want to know fast answers, right? We want it to be. Painless, simple, tra- you know, affordable, all those things. So if, if yeah. there's any way to do that now, make it easier for yourself. Yeah. Well, the, the, it's, it's never foolish to prepare, but if you don't prepare, you're foolish. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> oh, Bonnie, you can use well, that. Ed. You can use that, Bonnie. Okay, thanks, Ron. Okay. I'll remember that. <laughs> her, her book is called Extreme Weather. Where do we get more information? Uh, just visit insurance.com slash disaster prep. Great. Bonnie, thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Ron. Take care. Bye-bye. How are you? How are you today? Just fine. How are you? I'm great. U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission Acting Chairman Anne-Marie Merkel joins us, and we're talking about pool safety. Boy, it's that time of year where we start jumping into that thing. It is. Yes. And uh, sometimes we just jump into the pool without thinking very much, and apparently that's not a great idea. Well, and, and one of the reasons this is we're taking the time today to talk about this is because it is the time of year where people are just, everyone's so excited about the nice yeah, weather, and, yeah. and we see the highest incidence of drowning in the month of June. Uh, so we encourage families to take the steps, simple, quick steps, to keep their family safe, keep their kids safe, and prevent drowning. Yeah. Now, uh, your commission actually uh, has drowning reports. Uh, what do those say? So our most recent report indicates that on average, uh, about 360 children die per year in the, in the United States. Ooh. So that's about Ooh. one a day. And uh, three quarters of those deaths are children under the age of 15. And so it's, it's why we spend so much time focusing on uh, how, how you can be proactive mm-hmm. and keep your kids safe during this time of the year. Uh, what's interesting, and I don't know if it's psychological, but you have a shallow end of the pool and you have a deep end of the pool sometimes. And one thinks one because they're in the shallow area that nothing can happen to them. Is that is that true? No, I would say water is water, and the potential is there for a drowning, regardless of how deep it is. And so we encourage parents to learn how to swim themselves 
teach their children how to swim, make sure they know CPR, make sure if you have a pool or a spa that there's mm-hmm. a four-sided, four-foot wall a barrier around it with a self-latching gate. Yeah. Make sure uh, there's alarms on the gate and, and a door going out of your house. All of those things help you to keep your children safe. And it, it's they, they're simple and they're quick steps. Uh, and most importantly, to your point, make sure that if your kids are in the water, regardless, yeah. deep end, shallow end, mm-hmm. that there's a designated water watcher. I know that especially if if there's a, a pool at home, whether it be above ground or, or below ground or ground, whatever, uh, that uh, once you feel that a child pretty much can swim, you go in the house and the child's swimming in the pool. If there's an accident or something, it's not like alarms go off. It's a very silent killer if you're not on premises. Is that right? That's such a good point. Sometimes we see drownings on TV and there's splashing and yeah. there's all commotion. But in real life, they ha- happen quickly and they happen quietly. Mm-hmm. And so it really, parents, an adult, someone needs to supervise those children while they're in the water and really designate a person to commit to watching those kids. Yeah. Now, what about learning how to swim? Is, is, that, is that necessary? Key. It's critical. Not only should the parents know how to swim, mm-hmm. but make sure your children are, are learning how to swim uh, in the American Academy of Pediatrics just talked about starting kids swimming at age one year old. Yeah. So you can start them when they're little and then they become uh, familiar and not afraid of the water, but they have a respect for the water. Yeah. Uh, what about CPR? Is it a good idea to, I mean, there used to be a time when everybody took CPR classes just because they were there. Is that still that, a thing? That it certainly is. It's one of the critical steps. In addition to knowing how to swim, no CPR because CPR can save li- save lives, and it's it's critical. All right. Okay. Uh, now, what about the the construct of the pool itself? Can can that be dangerous in any sense, as far as uh, filters and doors and things? So uh, there was a problem with drains several years ago, uh-huh. and Congress enacted the law, the Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spy Act, okay. which in public pools protects the drains, the drain cover so children can't uh-huh. be injured or killed at the pool. But that does not apply to private pools. So we encourage uh-huh. families to make sure their drains are also compliant uh, with, with the law. Yeah. I mean, at some pools you do have uh, attendees there that, do, that, do, that does watch the pool, but not, certainly not in, in most cases. And it, uh, you know, yeah. we, we've even seen incidents where there have been lifeguards and children have still drowned. Really? If your child is in the pool, designate either yourself mm-hmm. or who, whomever's there, family member, designate a person to keep their eyes on that child and don't rely on anyone else. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I still have a fear of the water. I, I mean, I can swim and all that, but I don't like to be submerged in it for a period of time i think that's a little weird uh because i'm not a fish i don't know if anybody realized it but i don't have uh those kinds of lungs and i don't have gills so whatever it's interesting how human beings do all different kinds of environments that they were not necessarily designed to do (laughs) and and swimming is such fun and this time of the year is such fun but we see the highest rate of drownings in june from april through September, the, the drowning rate goes up. Sure. And again, that's one, one a day. So uh, we just want to alert parents that they can take quick, mm. simple steps and they can keep their kids safe. And if they want more information, yeah. they can go to poolsafely.gov. There's a tremendous amount of resources there um, in, in terms of how to keep your kids safe and take the Pool Safely pledge. Good. You know, when someone like you comes on uh, a program, uh, it just... You know, it's it, it, at the very least, it makes people say, hmm, I really should be a little more careful or I really should uh, heed some of the warnings here. So it's a good thing, Amory. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate okay, it. Thank take you. Care. Bye-bye. Um, so, yeah, I'm ready when you are. Let's talk some cheese, Ron. <laughs> Come on. I, I can't remember the last time someone said that to me. <laughs> Probably, and they will never say it to you again. <laughs> Cece Carmichael <laughs> joins us. She's classically trained chef, lifestyle expert, and Food Network star. 
And she, I think she's on this show more than I am, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> come to think of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're talking cheese today. And, uh, you know, that's I, I laugh, but people just love cheese. I mean, it's, it's, it's orgasmic it's, for many people. It, it, it is. It's a primal. It's a primal thing. I mean, you know, I, I always tell people that I, I, I like shopping for cheese more mm. than I like shopping for shoes. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, in, in the summertime, um, you know, my mantra is always keep it simple, plan ahead, because the worst thing, I used to, like, get so complicated mm-hmm. when I had parties. And I'd be running around, and, and at the end of the party, I'm like, I didn't talk to anybody. I was so, it's like, trying uh-huh. to you know, impress everybody, mm. and it doesn't take a lot of to impress people. Like, <coughs> you know, I always have, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, cheese you know, a, a, a humongous, dazzling cheese board at front and center at my parties mm. because literally everybody loves cheese, and if they if they don't like cheese, they're not invited to my party, basically. Oh, good for but, you. Um, and did you know that June is Dairy Month? Um, who didn't? Uh, no, I didn't. That's right? Know I didn't know that. It's, uh, no, I celebrate. I'm like, ah, June 1, Dairy Month, and nobody <laughs> cel- celebrates it better than Wisconsin cheese. And, and that's why I always have um, a, a simple but elaborate. When I say simple, it's simple because it's so easy to put together. You don't have to cook anything. Yeah. Just go cheese shopping. Um, and everybody loves cheese, and it's easy to impress with the incredibly wide selection of really the very best cheeses from Wisconsin. They are, they're, they're the state of cheese. They produce over 600 varieties of cheeses, so you always have plenty to choose from. Mm-hmm. And when you're shopping, and, and there's a, they have a little badge on them, so you know you're getting Wisconsin cheese. It says proudly Wisconsin cheese, so mm-hmm. you know you're getting the very best. And with the Wisconsin people, they take cheese, like to a a biblical level. I mean, they take it so seriously. They they've won more awards for their cheese oh, than any yeah. other it's, state. It's a, it, it is it is like a biblical thing. As a matter of fact, people say all the time that they discovered Jesus. So, they they they, you, they did, and and they. I mean, they won more well, awards than joke. any other it's state a, in the country, but joke. any other country. So yeah. it's like. You know, take that, France. Yeah. You know, take Wisconsin's that, got you beat. Take that, you and then, France. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then, and then um, they're the only U.S. state that requires a license to, to mm. produce cheese. So, mm. you know, all the cheesemakers are card-carrying, you know, license-carrying cheesemakers. So, you know you're getting wow. the very best. I, I wish you could see the varieties we have on this table here. I, there's something I I've never seen before that are so exotic and look so good, and my purse is going to be so full of cheese <laughs> at the end of this. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but, yeah. Uh, you should have, you should have like a, you know, they have, like, wine tasting. They should do cheese tasting. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Cheese day tasting is definitely a thing. Yeah. But you've got to have a little wine, too. I mean, it's like there's nothing oh, yeah. better than getting just those two components together. together. Yeah. And I have a cheese on, on set here that is a, is a Merlot-infused. It's almost like an, it tastes like an Asiago. Yeah, it's yeah. very salty and nutty, um, delicious. Um, so, you, so you've got your cheese platter. I also love to have, like, you know, with it being the summertime, you want something light, you want something fresh. Again, mm-hmm. super easy, can be done ahead of time, is a summer grilled chicken salad, you know, with the grilled chicken, mm-hmm. blackberry vinaigrette, mm-hmm. and then you sort of take it over the top, as long as we're, like, got all this cheese, with a decadent sprinkle of award-winning Wisconsin cheese over the top, some blackberries. It's fresh, it's gorgeous, and even if it's just these two things, some crackers, some good wine, um, you're good to go. Mm. Mm. Don't 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 sweat it. Don't sweat not it. Not allowed. Not not with cheese around. No. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, Wisconsin is known for the cheese, as you said it at the top. And when I think of cheese, I, you know, even at the the sporting events, they wear cheese on their head. Is that right? They do. Have you yeah, seen that? Yeah, they do. Yeah, the cheese heads. And I that's think. a serious thing. Those those yeah, big wedges around. of cheddar, the cheddar hats. Yeah, the which are hilarious. <laughs> I mean, so they, the, the, the entire if you're not making cheese, you're just proud that you're in the the, the best cheese making state in the the country yeah. in the world. Um, so, hey, <laughs> so uh, every, everybody's on board there in Wisconsin. Yeah. Give me a little uh, <laughs> cheese board. They're on, they're on cheese board. Uh, give me a little uh, a cheese fact. How how much? Uh, how do you make cheese? How much? You know? How do you do that? 
Well, we've got. It's funny because we have a B roll, which is, of course, your mm, radio. But right. it's just it's it's uh, you know the, you you put it in a big vat, you put in uh, rennet, and it, the, the the cheese uh, solids will come to the top. They scoop that off. Wow! It's it's so watching cheese getting made is such a beautiful thing. And they put it in the molds, and then they add whatever they age it or whatever hmm. you know whatever cheese it's going to become. Um, you know, put it in the in the molds and let it wow. age, or yeah. put the flavorings in it. I mean, we've got so many cheeses here with with just. Oh, I, I'm looking at it right now. Yes. There's the Asiago's, the Cheddar's, the Swiss's, the you know truffle infused vanilla. There's a one here that has Madagascar vanilla in it. That's I weird. mean, that's weird. It's weird, but like, don't you want to try that? I want to try everything. I want to try everything. <laughs> I don't even. I don't even care if it's cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, good. I, I don't care. but everything but you, with, yeah, cheese is every is be, everything's better with cheese on it. Uh, I I think that's known by man. I think I think I, I'm going to needle point that into a pillow. You could. I think it's absolutely. You could. But then I, I, I have <laughs> but, to get, yeah, I have to get royalties though if you do that. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. Um, and if you go to wisconsincheese.com, dot mm-hmm. com, mm-hmm. you can get fabulous recipes. Okay. You can learn. Um, and and when you're shopping in the grocery store, like I said, there's they have a little badge on their cheeses that says "Proudly Wisconsin Cheese," and then you know you're getting this fabulous, you know, you know, award-winning cheese. So. Cool. Well, if you want more information on cheese, not you, Cece, you already know this, but if you want I more, know yeah, and you, I know you do. Uh, it's <laughs> it's WisconsinCheese dot com, which I mean, who can not remember that? Uh, yeah. What if they wanted to follow uh, CC and see what she's doing and uh, that kind of thing? Well, they can, you can follow my Instagram feed. There's going to be I'll have pictures of everything that I um, there you go. that I'm talking about today, which Good. is Swell Food on mm-hmm. Instagram, S W E L L Food on Instagram, mm-hmm. and I'll be uh, posting all my all these beautiful cheese platters so all your listeners can see what the heck I'm talking about because. We have just the table's just about to yeah. tip over with so oh much my cheese God. here. It's a cheese world. Um, cheese world. <laughs> cheese world. Thank you. So it could be an amusement park. Oh my God. <gasps> when, oh, my. oh my God. Oh my God. I'm stealing that. Okay, you can have that one. Cheese world. That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on a hot Ron, day. Ron, you're the best. Thank, Thank you, you so Cece. much. Take care. Appreciate Bye-bye. it. Have a great summer. <laughs> yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm great. Stephanie Freiland joins us. She's Vice President of Merchandising Children's Books. And uh, we're talking uh, to her right now. Are you at the Barnes & Noble store, I understand? I am. I'm at the Barnes & Noble store in Clifton, New Jersey. All right. All right. The best Barnes & Noble store ever is in Clifton, New Jersey. <laughs> all right. That's, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, kids are just about to get out of school, if not already out, and that probably means uh, nothing going on for two and a half months, or does it? Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't mean that that's the end of uh, children using their brains and soaking in information. And I know that you're a, an advocate in uh, continuing to read through the summer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was important for us to understand why parents' expectations were as we approached summer reading this year. So we facilitated a survey, and we learned that nearly 90% of parents with kids between the ages of 6 and 17 plan to ask their kids to get off the devices and pick up a book this summer. That wasn't surprising. What was surprising was the number of books that they expect their kids to read. So 35% of our respondents anticipate their kids are going to read between four and six books this summer, Mm -hmm. and 26% expect their kids to read 10 or more books this summer, which is really great news. That is very good news. I would assume, as a layperson myself, um, who doesn't go to school anymore, uh, that when you're in school, the reading you do is because it's usually a sign for you to read this, because you have to. Summer reading is something you should do because you want to. So those uh, readings have to be something that the children, the kids really do want to read. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I think this is where Barnes & Noble has a great plan to help kids out this summer, parents and Mm -hmm. kids this summer. 
So what we're doing is coupling the hottest new releases this summer with in-store events. Mm -hmm. And what our booksellers are going to do is really bring to life these characters and this content to help kids find, through games and activities, the books that they love to read. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with an event around Treasure Hunters. Um, it's the newest book in James Patterson's Treasure Hunter series called All American Adventure games and activities to bring those stories to life. Mm -hmm. Then we are going to host an event called Game On. And so we'll explore some of the great guides around Minecraft and Roblox, Pokemon, and even Fortnite. Graphic novels is the fastest growing format in young readers, and yeah. it's a great way for kids to absorb books and appreciate the art. So for the first time, we're going to host Graphics Con, and we'll be taking a look at just Janie, the newest book from Terry Liebenson. And then in August, we're going to go behind the scenes of Escape from the Isle of the Lost, mm -hmm. and that's the newest book in the Descendant series, which is behind Disney's Descendant movie. Also, through the entire month of August, families can come into stores and redeem the summer reading journal. So just tell us what eight books you loved most that summer, and you can redeem that journal for a free book. Wow. See... Uh, this is great. Um, I I am a uh, a book romantic. Uh, when I read a newspaper, I sit down in the chair and I hear the crinkling of the paper and I feel comfortable. When I read a book, yeah. I don't look at a screen. I sit in a chair or whatever and I open the book up and I feel it and I proudly display it on my shelf. I mean, uh, that's th there's also an aspect to that. Um, very quickly, I know it's your interview, but... Um, Last summer, I saw a, a child walking around with a book under his arm, and I said to the parent, uh, what's going on? He says, oh, he loves that book, he takes a book with him everywhere, and when he has a chance, sits down, he opens up the book, but he's always carrying it around. I thought, my God, I want that child, but it wasn't, yeah. mine. It wasn't mine, so I couldn't do anything about it. But, uh, you couldn't take him. No, I couldn't take him. It's, that's not right, apparently. <laughs> but, I mean, I, 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 there was so much comfort and, and hope in, 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 that, in just that little uh, experience. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, and kids really are reading physical books, and they are really reading, too, as a family. Yeah. So that was another interesting takeaway from our survey, mm -hmm. that 69% said their families read together during the mm -hmm. summer, mm -hmm. and 55% plan to read the same books so that they yeah. can actually bond over those yeah, stories. Yeah, discuss them, so, yeah, yeah. That's cool. It's, it's a great way. And there are lots of authors, too, that do write separate books for mm -hmm. adults and kids, mm -hmm. like James Patterson or right. John Grisham, Bruce Cameron. So right. lots of great ways to share the experience as a family. Okay. So this is a way, uh, I mean, all those parents that said, yes, we'd like our kids to, to read during the summer at least a little bit and put the, the gaming and the phones down. Um, and it's one thing to say that, and it's one thing for the kid to actually say, yeah, okay, sure. And then for, to actually get them to be interested in doing that and actually following through is, I guess, where Barnes & Noble comes in in suggesting uh, these subjects and these books where the kids might actually get engaged. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think through games and activities, we learn that we can introduce kids to mm. new books and new characters that mm. they'll love. All right, fine. Well, uh, how do we get more information about this so a parent can uh, help their child along this path? You can talk to a bookseller at your local Barnes & Noble. They'll be happy to give you more information. You can also go to barnesandnoble.com where we've got information as well as some curated summer reading lists if you need help putting a list together for your kid. Excellent. Hey, thank you so much for your time today, Stephanie. This is a good information. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Lydia. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. Lydia Dean joins us now. She's the author of Jumping the Picket Fence, an interesting uh, book, actually. Uh, it's a, a story of, uh, of a woman's search for, for meaning, uh, which is something we all do. I mean, you know, no matter who you are. Uh, what, uh, what prompted you to, to write this? What was your inspiration? I was, um, at the time, just nearing 30, living in Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. and, um, 
you know, was aspiring to what I think all of us aspire to, just security, raising a family, you know, the, the sort of um, typical goals, and I was achieving them, and it, it, it all seemed so pretty on the outside, but um, didn't felt pretty on the inside. I just felt like I was just sort of going through the motions and mm. wasn't really connected um, to, to, to me, whoever that was, and I was very, very far from understanding who that was at the time. So I just, I just started to write things down um, with no other sort of, you know, purpose than to, to get some of these thoughts out. So yes. I just started writing things down in a journal, wow. and, and that's how it all started. My biggest regret in life is that uh, I didn't write things down. I, I have no journal, no diary of things I did on a daily basis, experiences I had, emotions and feelings that I had. I so much regret that because you can't do that all over again, one of the few things you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I guess part of the message is, like, in order to know yourself, you need to go back in time and and, and see where you were at, at any given time and what in, what changed you, inspired you to be who you are. Oh, I, I think that's so true. And, and the book actually took, you know, it spans 14 years of writing. And yeah. I, I never went into it thinking that I would mm-hmm. um, emerge an author. And I never went into it thinking that there was kind of a, a full, well, it's not fully, fully done yet because I'm still here, but yes. um, <laughs> I never thought that there would be a, a story behind yeah. all of those events. And... Yeah, so I, 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 I encourage everyone to just, you know, write down what you're feeling in the moment and certainly write down what's kind of tugging at your heart as you go to bed at night or wake up because those are, are sort of your life signs and they, they really do lead us. And, and this book is about sort of that crumb path yeah. where you don't really know where you're going. You're just following some gut, you know, gut mm-hmm. feeling. And when I look back, I'm, I'm just glad that, glad that I followed it. You, you're uh, among a small group of people who have basically traveled the world and in doing so have an understanding of humanity. Um, most of us, I, like probably almost all of us, never ever have that experience, never will. It just doesn't happen. Uh, you're very fortunate in that sense, but you decided to do this. Mm, absolutely. Um Absolutely decided. I mean, for me, it started at the beginning being sort of, again, confused over where I was at and why I wasn't really happy with that or why I, it, it didn't feel enough. And I, I started by quitting my job and just reading, um, reading a lot. I read about, you know, people who were climbing Mount Everest. I read about people who were, you know, taking a year or two off to be in the Peace Corps. I read anything that I could get my hands on that had to do with people getting out of the, the the daily grind and and searching and for me um, that meant reading about people who had searched out there in in the big kind of global world but I certainly don't feel it that our answers need to be out on that um, yeah. out, outside of where we are physically but but for me yes and so um, it started with books and then then you know we just kind of took a leap of faith and. Yeah. Uh, it, it meant stepping away from some level of security because we, my husband and I at the time had, you know, secure jobs and uh-huh. we were self-employed, but um, there was security in that, in that day to day. And yes. it was, it was scary to walk away from it. Yeah. And, and you both walked away from it. Is that right? Or one of you? Well, but initially, no. I mean, uh-huh. I was the one that was kind of coming out of my skin uh-huh. uh, at the moment. <laughs> and we agreed that I would stay home with the kids um, and reconnect with, with being a new mother. So uh-huh. that was, sort of my first step, and that he would keep the family business afloat. At the time, we were search consultants, so we had our own little consulting firm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, no, for the first few years, it, it, it was certainly a balance where, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, he stuck in with that and, and also didn't quite understand what I was going through. So he was just sort of, I think, attempting to, to maintain some stability while I, mm-hmm. um, you know, what seemed at the moment was kind of spinning sure. out of control, but really was, was yeah. needing to shed something that wasn't, wasn't me yeah. at the time. So I'm, I'm fascinated to ask you this, uh, with what you've done and the traveling that you've done, the experiences you've had, um, what, what is life and, 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 and the world experience? Is it, is it sad? Is it exhilarating? Is it tenuous? I mean, what, what have you walked away with? So far, oh, I've walked away with more um, inspiration, hope, um, more joy. Um, I've 
I guess I'll sum it up that in, in going to places, far away places where, where, you know, people are fighting for access to very, very basic things that we take for granted, right. health, education, their, their human rights. You would think, and I get asked that, that often working, um, and, and building a foundation that mm-hmm. helps people yeah. get access to these things. Yeah. Is it sad out there? Is it, is it, is it, you know, do you come home? with despair. And I have to say that, no, that uh, what we find are people working in some very, very difficult situations. But in doing so, I've seen more courage and I've seen more strength um, in, in, in places that you wouldn't expect. Uh, so for me, it's, um, I've learned more about the human spirit yeah. and about what, what we have inside of us that maybe is a little less tapped yeah. when, when we have our comforts around us. So, no, nope, huh. I've just, just been inspired and continue to be. Huh. I wonder what it was in your childhood uh, or in your DNA to, to have this type of inspiration and to actually do this. Um, it's not, uh, I don't want to use the term, it's not normal. I mean, it's, most people don't have, <laughs> most people don't have this, this drive to, to discover. Um, where do you think that came from in you? Well, um, my mother and father were um, born in in the UK and mm-hmm. emigrated to Canada, and and with not a whole lot in their in their pockets at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was a budding scientist, and my mother, um, um, a mom, an at home mom, very very compassionate. So I think I had sort of the best of both worlds mm-hmm. there. Very simple life. Uh, my dad, being a scientist, always asked me to ask questions. I mean, uh, there was always, you know, uh, dig, ask questions, don't, don't, uh, don't assume, uh, and, um, you know, go out there and discover. And I think that, coupled with my mother's compassionate side, made a, made a good kind of foundation for what I was to do later. Yeah. Hmm. What, uh, may I ask what age group you're in, what generation? Um, I'm just nearing 50. Okay. So heading, in, yeah, heading into a new phase, yeah. very reflective. Yeah. <laughs> so the, this took place over the course of 20-some years, the writing of the book and publishing it and yeah. building a foundation. Interesting. Okay. Um, the book's available everywhere, I understand, certainly. Better be. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Kindle. <laughs> Kindle and yeah. paperback. Excellent. Um what what are you are, are what are you doing now how are you pursuing uh, beyond this well um we built a philanthropic travel company so mm-hmm. other people could um and a foundation alongside it so other people could who experience what what i was out there sort of trailblazing in mm-hmm. in the early days right. um people who really feel like they want to connect with the world and understand what the problems are and also see see the solutions and be a part of those solutions so um i'm busy doing both of those things running a, a philanthropic travel company guiding trips around the world uh. and and also building a foundation to help strengthen um, small nonprofits uh. around the world so you're giving people who might have share your your visions a uh, path to uh, to actually do that. Absolutely. I mean, it was tough for me to find it. I had to. Mm-hmm. I felt like I had to create it for myself, and I I wouldn't want anybody else to to waste any time wondering. Right. You know. So I felt like I I should build a vehicle so that other people could who were who feeling the same way and needing that yes. connection to humanity um, could. So um, we run trips. Throughout the year, anyone's uh, invited to come. Um, they're wonderful, meaningful life journeys. Mm. Uh, we've got a few seats left on our trip to Guatemala this summer if people don't have summer plans. Mm. And uh, the foundation is a way that, uh, that people can, can learn about global issues, important global issues, and, and also you know, play a role in, in making the world a, a better place for you know, even yeah. though it sounds cliche, it's exactly what um, what it's about. Well, it's cliche because it's what it has always been. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, I wish there were more people like you, Lydia, and and your and your family, and and those that you inspire. Lydia Dean, jumping the picket fence, available everywhere. Is there a website people can visit? Absolutely. There's LydiaDean.com or there's the, uh, Go Philanthropic, and folks will find both the travel and the, the foundation. Okay. Under that. Let me spell Go your Let me spell your name for people. It's L Y D I A, and of course Dean D E A N. Lydia, great speaking That's to right. you. Thank you so much for your time today. You too. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.
We're speaking to uh, Jim DeSimone, who is uh, here uh, with us. Uh, this is a very interesting book called Medium Meddlers. And this is a, this is a real uh, murder mystery case, I understand. Yeah. Yep. Uh, now, your, your father was, uh, uh, was a lead detective uh, on this, I understand, as well. Correct. My father was uh, in charge from the day of the murders mm -hmm. through the uh, two trials. And uh, he was with the uh, Patterson Police Department? Uh, the State County Prosecutor's Office. Okay. He was chief of the State County Detectives. Gotcha. Okay. Um, this is this is a real life thing that's interesting because it is from an inside perspective. We usually don't get that when we when we get into these interesting cases. But what's uh, the the person who was on trial was actually a very famous person, right? Yep, Ruben Hurricane Carter, the uh, potential prize winner. Yeah, who was who was on the downside of his career at the time. And uh, this, uh, t tell me exactly uh, what happened uh, very shortly, what what took place on, on this faithful day. Well, what happened was, uh, I remember I was a young man, I was yeah. probably 13 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a call in the middle of the night about 2, 2 a.m., and uh, my father was called down to a um, bar in Patterson, New Jersey, where there was a multiple murder, mm -hmm. and um, that's part of the chain of events from... Uh, First trial uh, when they were put him and John Artis were convicted of uh, triple murder uh -huh. to uh, the second trial that was like 12 years later. Right. And throughout these trials, uh, my dad was the lead detective on both uh, on the case both times. Yeah, he was and, in charge of homicide. Uh, now this incident actually took place uh, almost t to the day um, back in 1966. Uh, Correct. What what prompted you to write this book? Well, what happened was uh, after the second trial before my father passed away, mm -hmm. he had written a manuscript for the true facts of the case, and I had the manuscript for many years. Ah. And up till 2011, my mom, fearful for the family, was giving me a hard time. Uh, not giving me a hard time, but she was asking me if I would not do it because she was afraid of any repercussions. Yeah. So I held off in 2011. My mother passed away. And then about a, two years ago, the BBC, British Network out of British Columbia, came to me, and they were going to do a 14-episode podcast. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time with them. First, I wasn't going to do it because throughout this case, there's been so much sensationalism and right. blatant lies that I really didn't want to get involved. But then I decided that I would. I got involved, and at that point, I said to myself, you know, maybe it's time that we put out the true story from the court records and my father's recollections and everything right. that was in writing and, and as far as the testimonies. And I finally decided to do it, and I'm glad I did. Wow. Was, was your father at, at peace with the outcome? Oh, very much so, very much so. The biggest issue was, and what, po what possessed me to do it really, mm -hmm. was my father spent his whole life uh, working very hard on his reputation, yep. having to do with honesty and integrity. Mm -hmm. And throughout these trials, uh, the defendants and the people in the case hated him as a racist cop out to get Reuben Carter. And that was uh, the farthest thing from the truth. Okay. And uh, I just decided that I wanted to, for the last time, I wanted to uh, vindicate my father and his reputation, and I wanted him to finally rest in peace. Yeah, okay. Um how long did it? Well, you had you had all the information you needed to put this book together with uh, with all the records and, and all the documentations. Then, right, the book is. I mean, it's over fifty years old. So there were some. Yeah. There were a lot of editing issues, but no, nothing was changed as far yeah. as the content. There was a lot of editing issues. We spent a lot of time on editing and changing, correcting language, et cetera, et cetera, and um, the finished product came out very well. Yeah. Um. There were other uh, celebrities and well-knowns that were involved in this case as a matter of persuasion, uh, I read. Yeah, Rob, what happened was uh, after they got, there was a woman named Carolyn Kelly who was mm -hmm. the biggest advocate for getting uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter and John Artis out of prison after 12 years, I believe it was. And um, all of a sudden, all celebrities from all around the world uh, got involved in the backing of Ruben Carter, that he was mm -hmm. wrongfully convicted, et cetera, et cetera. And then right uh, 
during the break that he was out of prison from his first to second sentence, um, she was beat up pretty bad by Ruben Carter. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all of the celebrities that were involved, they all disappeared. At the conviction at the second trial, there was not a celebrity there. The courtroom was almost empty. Wow. Interesting stuff. Uh, yep. th- the book is uh, called Media Meddlers, and it's, uh, it's, it's the real truth uh, behind what happened on this day uh, way back in, in uh, 66, uh, which is, you know, to me, it's more fascinating to go back in history and look at those things because I wouldn't use the term magical, but they're just, they have more meaning when you, when you go back in time and look at something. It's, uh, most of us don't have a real grasp on history, and this kind of helps us out to see what actually happened when a lot of us weren't around. Um, you're in Bergen right. County now, I understand. Yeah, I'm in uh, White Park, New Jersey. Ah, okay. I'm I'm from Teaneck. Uh, no connection, oh, but sure. you know, well, well. same county. Well, well, born and raised. This area. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, how do we? Uh, well, the book's available everywhere. How do we follow you? And if we wanted to, you know, someone wanted to follow your career here. The best way to do everything. The best way to get the most information mm-hmm. is to go onto our website www.mediamedalers.com. Good. And that'll be updated on a pretty constant basis. The book's available through Barnes and Noble and Amazon. And I think, if nothing else, people that have interest in that history from that period, in this case, they'll get the true facts of what really transpired once and for all. It's it's a it it's it's a real crime drama, is what it is. And then uh, into the courtroom, and and your actual uh, firsthand uh, account with all, with all the information. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Media Meddlers, uh, it's great talking to you. All right, Rod, thank you very much, and thanks for taking the interest. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Hi. Hello, Hi. everybody. Hello. Uh, Ali Killam joins us. She's an Airbnb consumer trends expert, and Juliana Cintron is with 23andMe, the genetics uh, trend expert. And together, they've kind of gotten together and come up with an interesting thing to do. Um, Let me see if I can marry this together for you here. Um, What you do is you genetically find out uh, where your homeland is, so to speak, (laughs) going back to the 12th century or whatever. And then you actually go there uh, and stay over and and, uh, make that actual physical connection geographically. Do I have it right? <laughs> you got it. Yeah, pretty right. much. Nailed on the head. <laughs> yeah. Kind of an interesting concept, uh, actually. Um, there are people that are, like, really into this and mm-hmm. and actually feel complete when they know uh, where they came from. And then, like, step two of completeness is to actually go there, where apparently mm-hmm. in another life you were walking around. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's a huge trend we've been seeing on Airbnb in recent years. In fact, the number of people who have turned to Airbnb to do heritage travel has increased by 500% mm-hmm. since 2014. And as you mentioned, we think this is just a huge trend because people are curious, right? They want to know um, more about their family history and therefore their own personal identities. Right. And at-home genetics tests like 23andMe have made it easier than ever before yeah. to connect with that ancestry and actually, mm-hmm. you know, know ex- pretty much exactly where you, you've come from and where your ancestors originated from. Yeah. And um, and people are looking for travel these days. It's not just a vacation to kick back and relax, although nothing yeah. wrong with that. <laughs> Everyone loves some of that every now and again. Um, but they're also looking for travel that fosters both a deep connection to the place and the people that yeah. you're visiting yeah. as well as this kind of personal transformation. Yeah. So we think that uh, that's why we've seen this rise in heritage travel, and it's why we mm-hmm. decided to team up together to make it easier for yeah. people to do that. That's does Airbnb kind of make it a little bit more family uh, personalish as opposed to staying in a hotel when you're doing something like this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, you know, when you travel on Airbnb, you're staying with actual locals that live in the place that you're visiting or taking experiences with led by local experts who can really give you this more behind-the-scenes, off-the-beaten-track, mm-hmm. really authentic experience that you might not be able to explore or would even know about if you were staying in the more traditional tourism districts of different places that you're visiting. Um, so, yeah, it definitely gives you that insider's yeah. look into you know where your family might have come from, how they might have lived, yeah. uh, which is, I think, a lot 
cloud travelers find really special. Yeah, you kind yeah, of you get into the culture a little bit more in the way of life if it's not a country that you're familiar with already. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. the collaboration makes it really easy for customers to mm. look through their you know ancestry populations uh, and then have this unique travel experience yeah. um, by going to these you know Airbnb homes. Um, and experiences from within their 23andMe account. They can go and, and look through their ancestry populations um, and then explore all the different mm-hmm. opportunities that there are, uh, you know, in their native countries. But also it's not limited to just that. Uh, it might be to an area where they might not have a genetic tie, but uh-huh. just a, a very personal interest. Yeah, in. yeah. Juliana, what, 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 what's going on? Like, why all of a sudden has there been this explosion in interest about where we supposedly had roots from. I would, what, what happened? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a, a small piece of the puzzle. Mm. Uh, you know, identity isn't just genetics. This uh-huh. is just one, one small piece. Um, and we heard from our customers that they want a tangible and meaningful way to explore mm. their roots. Um, and so that's why we partnered with Airbnb to, to do that. But, yeah. yeah, I think part of it is, you know, curiosity, uh, confirming whether, uh, you know, their ancestry is from where they might have heard, you know, their aunt or uncle or, you know, other relatives yeah. talking about, um, or, or to be surprised. You know, some people, you know, like adoptees might not know um, where they have roots from, and so 23andMe makes it easy, it's accessible, um, you know, in order to be able to, to find out where you're from. Yeah, it's right. kind of, it's psychologically kind of interesting. I mean, let's mm-hmm. say you, you have Italian roots, you've never been to Italy, and you go yeah. there, you do the Airbnb, and you're just walking down a neighborhood street. Uh, it's not as much sightseeing, actually, as, as much as it is neighborhood when you do the Airbnb. And, uh, yeah. and you actually say to yourself, wow, I, my ancestors actually walked down the yeah. street to, to buy a piece of bread. I mean, it's a little bit crazy, yeah. but at the same time, humanly, it's very comforting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah. And, I mean, we've also made it between 23andMe and Airbnb. It's also easy. You know, if you can't plan your own heritage travel trip, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're also able to explore your heritage right outside, um, you know, right yeah, outside yeah, your home, right yeah. in your own backyard. Yeah. Uh, in Boston, for example, you mm-hmm. actually can get a taste of Italy from an well, Italian yeah. host well, yeah, yeah, yeah. who lives in Boston. Of right. course, I'm sure you know. Um, and he hosts, his name's Anthony. He hosts something called the Politically Incorrect Food Tour where you get to try <laughs> <laughs> a lot of different local. Uh, a lot of eat- local eateries that are um, owned by local Italian families in the North End. Okay. So. Yeah. so let's say uh, someone has already done the uh, 23andMe or, or they're considering doing that and yeah. then they want to do this this part two of actually traveling to that area. How do you go about doing that? Now, who do we get in contact with? How does that happen? Yeah, so within 23andMe, you actually just go uh, on the website into your 23andMe account, Mm -hmm. uh, and within your Ancestry Composition Report, um, you can go and explore the ancestries that are available there, Uh um, and that'll take you to a carousel of options uh, within your native countries. Um, But also, like I mentioned, you can go through all of the different populations that we have and and kind of view whatever is of interest to you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can do the same thing on Airbnb.com, too. When you yeah. visit the site, you'll be able to see different landing pages that yeah. have all of the corresponding genetic populations you can find on 23andMe. Hey, it's a different new idea, and it's not a bad one either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ron. Have oh, a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Hi. Hello, Hi. everybody. Hello. Uh, Allie Kalem joins us. She's an Airbnb consumer trends expert. And Juliana Cintron is with 23andMe, the genetics uh, trend expert. And together, they've kind of gotten together and come up with an interesting thing to do. Um, let me okay. see if I can marry this together for you here. Um, what you do is you genetically find out uh, where your homeland is, so to speak, <laughs> going back to the 12th century or whatever. And then you actually go there uh, and stay over and and uh, make that actual physical connection geographically. Do I have it right? <laughs> you got it. Pretty right. much. Nailed it on the head. <laughs> yeah. Kind of an interesting concept, uh, actually. Um, there are people that are, like, really into this and mm-hmm. and actually feel complete when they know uh, where they came from, and then, like, step two of completeness is to actually go there, where apparently mm-hmm. in another life you were walking around. I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's a huge trend we've been seeing on Airbnb in recent years. In fact, the number of people who have turned to Airbnb to do heritage travel has increased by 500% mm -hmm. since 2014. And as you mentioned, we think this is just a huge trend because people are curious, right? They want to know um, more about their family history and therefore their own personal identities. Right. And at-home genetics tests like 23andMe have made it easier than ever before to yeah. connect with that ancestry and actually, mm -hmm. you know, know exactly pretty much exactly where you, you've come from and where your ancestors originated from. Yeah. And um, and people are looking for travel these days. It's not just a vacation to kick back and relax, although nothing yeah. wrong with that. <laughs> Everyone loves some of that every now and again. Um, but they're also looking for travel that fosters both a deep connection to the place and the people that yeah. you're visiting yeah. as well as this kind of personal transformation. Yeah. So we think that uh, that's why we've seen this rise in heritage travel, and it's why we mm -hmm. decided to team up together to make it easier for yeah. people to do that. That's does Airbnb kind of make it a little bit more family, uh, personal-ish as opposed to staying in a hotel when you're doing something like this? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, you know, when you travel on Airbnb, you're staying with actual locals that live in the place that you're visiting or taking experiences with led by local experts who can really give you this more behind-the-scenes, off-the-beaten-track, mm -hmm. really authentic experience that you might not be able to explore or would even know about if you were staying in the more traditional tourism districts of different places that you're visiting. Um, so, yeah, it definitely gives you that insider's yeah. look into, you know, where your family might have come from, how they might have lived, yeah. uh, which is, I think, a lot travelers find really special yeah you kind yeah. of you get into the culture a little bit more in the way of life if it's not a country that you're familiar with already exactly yeah. and yeah. the collaboration makes it really easy for customers mm. to look through their you know ancestry populations uh and then have this unique travel experience yeah. um by going to these you know airbnb homes um and experiences from within their 23 me account they can go and and look through their ancestry populations um, and then explore all the different mm -hmm. opportunities that there are, uh, you know, in their native countries. But also it's not limited to just that. Uh, it might be to an area where they might not have a genetic tie, but uh -huh. just a, a very personal interest. Yeah, in. yeah. Juliana, what, 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 what's going on? Like, why all of a sudden has there been this explosion in interest about where we supposedly had roots from? I would, what, what happened? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a, a small piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, identity isn't just genetics. This uh -huh. is just one one small piece. Um, and we heard from our customers that they want a tangible and meaningful way to explore mm. their roots. Um, and so that's why we partnered with Airbnb to, to do that. But, yeah. yeah, I think part of it is, you know, curiosity, uh, confirming whether, uh, you know, their ancestry is from where they might have heard, you know, their aunt or uncle or, you know, other relatives yeah. talking about, um, or, or to be surprised. You know, some people, you know, like adoptees might not know um, where they have roots from, and so 23 Me makes it easy, it's accessible, um, you know, in order to be able to, to find out where you're from. Yeah, it's right. kind of, it's psychologically kind of interesting. I mean, let's mm -hmm. say you, you have Italian roots, you've never been to Italy, and you go yeah. there, you do the Airbnb, and you're just walking down a neighborhood street. Uh, it's not as much sightseeing, actually, as, as much as it is neighborhood when you do the Airbnb. And, uh, yeah. and you actually say to yourself, wow, I, my ancestors actually walked down the yeah. street to, to buy a piece of bread. I mean, it's a little bit crazy, yeah. but at the same time, humanly, it's very comforting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah. And, I mean, we've also made it, between 23andMe and Airbnb, it's also easy. You know, if you can't plan your own heritage travel trip, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're also able to explore your heritage right outside, um, you know, right yeah, outside yeah, your home, right yeah. in your own backyard. Yeah. Uh, in Boston, for example, you mm -hmm. actually can get a taste of Italy from an well, Italian yeah, host well, yeah, yeah, yeah. who lives in Boston. Of right. course, I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, and he hosts, his name's Anthony. He hosts something called the Politically Incorrect Food Tour, where you get to try <laughs> a lot of different local. Uh, a lot of e local eateries that are um, owned by local Italian families in the North End. Okay. So. Yeah. so let's say uh, someone has already done the uh, 23 Me, or, or they're considering doing that, and yeah. then they want to do this, this part two of actually traveling to that area. How do you go about doing that? Uh, who, who do we get in contact with? How does that happen? 
Yeah, so within 23andMe, you actually just go uh, on the website into your 23andMe account, mm -hmm. uh, and within your Ancestry Composition report, um, you can go and explore the ancestries that are available there, uh -huh. um, and that'll take you to a carousel of options uh, within your native countries. Um, but also, like I mentioned, you can go through yeah. all of the different populations that we have and, and kind of view whatever is of interest to you. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can do the same thing on Airbnb.com, too. When you yeah. visit the site, you'll be able to see different landing pages that yeah. have all of the corresponding genetic populations you can find on 23andMe. Hey, it's a different new idea, and it's not a bad one either. Uh, <laughs> thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ron. Have uh, a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. There you have it, kids. Some uh, guests that we've had on the program interview-wise, stay tuned. There's another show uh, right before this or after this, I don't know, uh, for this uh, day as well. This is an extra thrown in. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, I wish you peace. Peace.